What's up, Ice and Fire fans? Welcome back to the House of Vine podcast and part 3 of the Melisandre POV breakdown. In my last two videos, we've been watching and observing Melisandre while she looks deep into the hearth's fire, searching for and interpreting the vision shown to her by Relor. Now that we've discussed all the gritty, thought-provoking material, that being all of the fire visions, we can finally move on to some actual human interaction. If you remember, Mel has been up all night sitting next to the hearth. With the rise of the sun comes the rise of Castle Black. The first person to meet Mel whilst in her chambers is Stannis' own squire, Devin Seaworth. Let's listen in on young Devin and Mel's interactions. Devin, she called. A drink. Yes, my lady. The boy poured her a cup of water from the stone jug by the window and brought it to her. Thank you. Melisandre took a sip, swallowed, and gave the boy a smile. That made him blush. The boy was half in love with her, she knew. He fears me, he wants me, and he worships me. All the same, Devon was not pleased to be here. The lad had taken great pride in serving as a king's squire, and it had wounded him when Stannis commanded him to remain at Castle Black. Like any boy his age, his head was full of dreams of glory. No doubt he had been picturing the prowess he would display at Deepwood Mott. Other boys his age had gone south to serve as squires to the king's knights and ride into battle at their side. Devon's exclusion must have seemed a rebuke, a punishment for some failure on his part, or perhaps for some failure of his father. So we see here that Devon is not off with Stannis as he marches on Winterfell. Mel tells us that Devon is most likely hurt by his being left behind, that he probably thinks it's a punishment for something that he or his father had done. Mel goes on to tell us that the reason he was left at Castle Black was because she had requested it. She talks about Davos and Devon's four brothers who died in the battle on the Blackwater. It's clear by her actions that Mel is protecting Devon Melisandre keeping Devon out of harm's way in order to protect Davos from losing any more sons implies that Stannis is marching towards defeat. This thing about Davos brings up something very interesting, but for you to understand what I mean, we need to listen to a little bit more of this chapter pertaining to the Seaworths. In truth, he was here because Melisandre had asked for him. The four eldest sons of Davos Seaworth had perished in the battle on the Blackwater, when the king's fleet had been consumed by green fire. Devon was the fifth born, and safer here with her than at the king's side. Lord Davis would not thank her for it, no more than the boy himself, but it seemed to her that Seaworth had suffered enough grief. Misguided as he was, his loyalty to Stannis could not be doubted. She had seen that in her flames. Did you catch it? Probably not because you don't know what you're listening for. Let me shed some light. Listen closely to Melisandre's last two sentences. Misguided as he was, his loyalty to Stannis could not be doubted. She had seen that in her flames. Now do you get it? No? Okay, okay, let me get to the point. Remember, at this point of the book, word has spread that Davos has been executed by the Manderleys. When we read A Feast for Crows, Cersei Chapter 5, we read that Cersei has received word from Lord Wyman about the apparent demise of the Onion Knight. Your Grace, glad tidings. Wyman Mandalay has done as you commanded and beheaded Lord Stannis's Onion Knight. We know this for a certainty. The man's head and hands have been mounted above the walls of White Harbor. Lord Wyman avows this, and the phrase confirm. They have seen the head there with an onion in its mouth, and the hands, one marked by his shortened fingers. Very good, said Cersei. Send a bird to Mandalay and inform him that his son will be returned forthwith, now that he has demonstrated his loyalty. It isn't until A Dance with Dragons that we learned that this was a farce created by the Manderleys in order to save face with the Iron Throne and the Boltons. In truth, Davos is alive and is out searching for Rickon Stark, 
on behalf of Lord Wyman in order to solidify an alliance between Stannis and House Manderley. Since the Iron Throne has heard the news about Lord Davos, we can assume that most of the Seven Kingdoms know this as well. However, I believe Mel already knows for a fact that Davos is alive. The evidence is laid out in those last two sentences. The very last sentence implies that she has recently seen Davos in her flames. The line, misguided as he was, his loyalty to Stannis could not be doubted, means that, although Davos is not a follower of the Red God, he is unyielding in his loyalty to Stannis. This is shown in his actions, Davos off searching for Rickon to solidify the baratheon manderley alliance. This is most likely what Melisandre has seen him doing in her flames. According to Melisandre, Devon is very smart and able. However, the same cannot be said of the other men-at-arms Stannis left behind at Castle Black. Let's hear what Melisandre thinks about these other soldiers. Devon was quick and smart and able too, which was more than could be said about most of her attendants. Stannis had left a dozen of his men behind to serve her when he marched south, but most of them were useless. His grace had need of every sword, so all he could spare were greybeards and cripples. One man had been blinded by a blow to his head in the battle by the wall. Another lamed when his falling horse crushed his legs. Her sergeant had lost an arm to a giant's club. Three of her guard were geldings that Stannis had castrated for raping wildling women. She had two drunkards and a craven too. Having guards about her would no doubt help keep the Black Brothers properly respectful, the Red Priestess knew. But none of the men that Stannis had given her were like to be much help, should she find herself in peril. It made no matter. Melisandre of Ashai did not fear for herself. Relore would protect her. Stannis leaving these broken, weak old soldiers behind might be evidence that Melisandre and her king are not as close as they were in previous books. In the past, Stannis might have left her capable men, such as Justin Massey, but Mel is not worried, believing that Relor will keep her safe. One of the first things that Mel learns to see in her flames is any danger that might come to her persons. Let's continue listening to the chapter. Devon fed fresh lugs to the fire until the flames leapt up again fierce and furious, driving the shadows back into the corners of the room devouring all her unwanted dreams. The dark recedes again for a little while, but beyond the wall, the enemy grows stronger, and should he win, the dawn will never come again. She wondered if it had been his face that she had seen staring out at her from the flames. No, surely not. His visage would be more frightening than that, cold and black, and too terrible for any man to gaze upon and live. The wooden man she had glimpsed, though, and the boy with the wolf's face, they were his servants, surely, his champions, as Stannis was hers. So Melisandre starts to think of the enemy, the real enemy being the Whites and the others, not the Boltons and the Lannisters. She knows that they are growing stronger in number by the day. She then reflects on the vision of the wooden man and the wolf boy, Bloodraven and Bran. She first thinks that Bloodraven was actually the Great Other, but then decides that these two are just his champions the same way Stannis is hers. Usually Martin's POV characters are wrong when they make assumptions such as this, but I think Mel is right on the money on this one, at least in regards to Bloodraven. Thanks to Teflon TV, I subscribe to the theory that Bloodraven and the Children of the Forest are up to no good. More on that can be found in the upcoming fourth installment of my Bloodraven biography series. Now, let's skip ahead a little bit to Melisandre's summoning of Rattleshirt, aka the Lord of Bones. You may find the Wilding as well. Tell him that I must speak with him. Rattleshirt, my lady, and quickly. While the boy was gone, Melisandre washed herself and changed her robes. Then came a rapping at her door, her one-armed sergeant. Lady Melisandre, the Lord of Bones is come. The wilding wore a sleeveless jerkin of boiled leather dotted with bronze studs, beneath a worn cloak mottled in shades of green and brown. 
no bones. He was cloaked in shadows too, in wisps of ragged gray mist, half seen, sliding across his face and form with every step he took. Ugly things, as ugly as his bones. A widow's peak, close set dark eyes, pinched cheeks, a moustache wriggling like a worm above a mouthful of broken brown teeth. Melisandre felt the warmth in the hollow of her throat as her ruby stirred at the closeness of its slave. You have put aside your suit of bones. The clacking was like to drive me mad. The bones protect you. The Black Brothers do not love you. Devon tells me that only yesterday you had words with some of them over supper. A few? The wildling sat on the edge of the window, slid his dagger from his sheath. If some crow wants to slip a knife between my ribs whilst I'm spooning up some supper, he's welcome to try. <laughs> Melisandre paid the naked steel no mind. It is their eyes that should concern you, not their knives, she warned him. The glamour of oh, <laughs> In the black arm fetter about his wrist, the ruby seemed to pulse. He tapped it with the edge of his blade. Must I wear the bloody bones as well? The spell is made of shadow and suggestion. Men see what they expect to see. The bones are part of that. Was I wrong to spare this one? If the glamour fails, they will kill you. You shall have work for your steel soon enough. The enemy is moving, the true enemy, and Lord Snow's rangers will return before the day is done with their blind and bloody eyes. The wildling's own eyes narrowed. Melisandre could see the color change with each pulse of the ruby. Cutting out the eyes, that's a weeper's work. Snow's been assuming the free folk would turn to torment to lead them because that's what he would do but this weeper did not matter none of his free folk matter how well do you know the north he slipped his blade away as well as any raider some parts more than others <laughs> there's a lot of north why the girl she said a girl in gray on a dying horse Jon Snow's sister. We must win the Lord Commander's trust, and the only way to do that is to save her. Me save her, you mean? The Lord of Bones? <laughs> no one ever trusted Rattleshirt but fools. He broke off at the sound of a war horn and rose swiftly to his feet. One long blast of the horn meant rangers returning. So Rattleshur enters her chambers and right away we can tell that something is off due to how he's described by Melisandre. For one thing, Mel speaks of shadows sliding around his face, which is followed by her asking him why he isn't wearing his bones. Rattleshirt responds by saying that the noise would drive him mad. As a reader, you should find it strange that Rattleshirt would say this considering his nickname comes from the armor of bones that he always wears. Mel tells him that he shouldn't be antagonizing the Black Brothers and that he should be careful of their looking at his face. This is when Martin points out that Rattleshirt has a red glowing ruby on his wrist, followed by Mel speaking of glamouring spells. She also refers to the one on his wrist as the slave to the one around her neck. As the scene continues, we see it is clear that this man is not Rattleshirt. Mel thinks to herself if it was wrong to spare this man. She puts the thought aside and then speaks to the wildling about a task that she has for him. She tells him about the eyeless faces returning to the wall, and he claims that this is the work of the Weeper. I want to point out that Melisandre refers to the wildlings as his people, our first clue as to who this man really is. He then talks about who the wildlings would follow now that their king is dead. This is more evidence that this isn't Rattleshirt because nowhere in the Song of Ice and Fire series are there any signs of Rattleshirt displaying such intrigue, for he is only a simple soldier. Melvin tells him about the girl and her flames. 
and that she believes this gray girl is Arya Stark fleeing the Boltons. She wants the Wildling to leave the Wall and search for her, to bring Arya safely back to her brother John. The Wildling laughs at this notion, claiming that no one ever trusted Rattleshirt. Seems strange for the Lord of Bones to suddenly speak in the third person. The conversation is then cut off by a warhorn sounding the return of rangers. This is where we'll stop. We'll pick this chapter back up in part 4 where we'll discuss Mel and John's meeting on the other side of the wall. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe to stay updated and be the first to watch newly uploaded videos.